All right, today we are starting on the DNA fingerprinting portion of the unit. Uh, so we're going to do just a brief overview of DNA. Now, if you remember this stuff from biology, then great. Um, if not, if it's been a while, you may need this refresher. But I feel like it's important for us to first go back and talk about some of the basics with regards to DNA before we jump into how DNA is used in forensics. Ultimately, though, we are going to talk about how DNA is used in forensics, how DNA can be collected from a crime scene, how it can be helpful, specifically how it's extracted from evidence and suspects, and then ultimately how it's linked back to a particular suspect. Now, if it has been a while since your last biology course, or you've never taken biology, then I want you to pause the video and go to YouTube and search Amoeba Sisters DNA. There are some great um, videos over DNA from Amoeba Sisters, and if you need just a refresher over DNA, um, definitely check those videos out and then come back to this one for the lesson. All right, so if it has been a while since you have had biology, you might remember that except for identical twins, no two people have the same DNA. There have been many advances in the last 20 years in DNA technology and its um, use in solving criminal cases. If you join me for the Innocence Project lesson, you know that it's also been um, instrumental in helping to solve or re-examine post-conviction cases. So DNA is considered individual evidence because it does link to a specific person. Now, all the stars in the sky have to line up for that to happen, but it is possible. So we say that DNA is considered individual evidence. So if I'm a crime scene investigator, I am looking for DNA evidence because it is um, a crucial part of an investigation. It can really help solidify a case. And so I'm working the crime scene. I'm going to be thinking, where could there have been skin or blood or saliva or urine or semen or hair left behind? And then I'm going to search for that, try to find it so that I can secure that DNA evidence. Now we have something called DNA fingerprinting. You'll sometimes uh, hear it referred to as DNA profiling. It's used in criminal and legal cases to determine identity, um, or it can be used in um, cases to figure out parentage. So um, if you watch the show Mari, you know that it's been used a ton to determine who may or may not be the father of a child. Um, it's also used in some health applications. We'll talk about that in a future lesson. Um, and definitely in crime scene investigation to determine identity or to get a match between evidence and a suspect. All right, so going all the way back to biology where you talked about the cell, uh, DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. It is located in the nucleus of the cell, and we know that it carries an organism, organism's genetic information. The DNA is a polymer that is um, made up of many monomers. We call these nucleotides. And the structure of DNA can get pretty complicated, but we're going to keep it basic for forensics. So each nucleotide has three parts. We have a phosphate group. We have a sugar, which in this particular case we call deoxyribo. And then um, a nitrogen-containing base or nitrogenous base. Now, one molecule of human DNA contains billions of nucleotides, billions, but there's only four types within the DNA. So we have thymine, cytosine, adenine, and guanine. And we use these letters to represent these words because we don't want to write them out every time. Um, and you may remember from biology, A always pairs with T and C always pairs with G. So it is true that 99% of our DNA is the same from person to person, but there are segments um, within our DNA. We call these segments short tandem repeats or STRs, which are basically letters of DNA that repeat over and over and over and over. But these STRs differ from person to person. So basically you can take a DNA profile or a DNA fingerprint, which focuses on these STRs, 
that are separated from the rest of our DNA that's the same from person to person, um, and we can create what's called a genetic profile. If I just confused you, no worries. We're going to follow up um, with more detail in a future lesson. I just wanted to point that out. So the same four bases are found in the DNA of all organisms, but their proportions are different. So the sequence of my genetic code is different from the sequence of your genetic code. So in the DNA of each organism, we have um, adenine and thymine and cytosine and guanine, and they equal um, according to base pairing rules. And again, you may want to write this down, apple in a tree, car in a garage. That's how you can remember the base pairing rules. All right, so on a quiz or a test or a worksheet, I might ask you how these nucleotides would pair in a DNA sequence. So I give you um, one part of the equation you have to complete. So you'll have to use your base pairing rules to answer this. So if you will, pause the video and just write down how these nucleotides would pair. All right, so I want to go over the answers quickly so that you can make sure that you know this. Um, so for this first sequence, the nucleotide pair would be T-A-G-C-C-G-A-T-G-C-A. -A. For the second one, you should have A-T-T-C-G-G-C-T-A-T-A. -T -T -A. And then for the last one, you should have C, G, T, A, C, G, T, A, A, T, G. Again, if you're confused by that, go all the way back to the beginning of this lesson and check out those Amoeba Sisters videos because they will help you understand um, how to pair these. All right, so if DNA is found at a crime scene, we know it belongs to someone. And a match can be found through several steps. So it starts by removing the DNA from the crime scene, and then there's a complicated process that it goes through to match it to a suspect or to a victim. And we call that DNA electrophoresis or gel electrophoresis. And we're, again, we're going to talk about that in a future lesson. So in comparison to time, DNA is fair, a fairly new technology. Um, so it was developed by Sir Alec Jeffries and um, really came into play in the world of forensics in the early 90s. And we've been using it ever since. DNA to this point is considered the most useful form of evidence in obtaining convictions. So it is definitely something that crime scene investigators want to hunt for when they're working a crime scene and trying to um, collect evidence from a crime scene. All right, so when DNA is found, it's compared to a digital national database we call CODIS. So CODA stands for Combined DNA Index System, and it contains DNA profiles that have been contributed by federal, state, and local participating forensics labs. So it's just a national database. It's digital. Um, the FBI sort of houses it, and um, it, it's used in a lot of different um, cases. So sometimes the question comes up, what if the DNA is not registered in the CODIS database? And there, you, there's no way to compare DNA profiles digitally. Well, then investigators have to collect a suspect sample. So without that suspect sample or without that DNA sample being in CODIS, you're not going to find a match. So I know when we watch shows like CSI, it seems as though all an investigator has to do is just swab for DNA and magically a computer reads the DNA profile and matches it to people in the world and their picture comes up and their address comes up on a computer screen and it's just that easy. It is not just that easy. There's quite a few steps involved. Um, and again, you either have to have a suspect sample to compare your evidence sample DNA to, or the suspect has to be in the CODIS database. 
So how is DNA collected from a suspect? Well, there's a few different ways. DNA can be collected from their hair, from blood, from saliva, but most commonly it's going to be uh, collected in cheek cells. So we call this a buccal swab where an investigator or a lab analyst just kind of collects cheek cells from the suspect and then a DNA profile is cr created from that. 